south of the border Down Mexico way That's where I fell in love When the stars above came out to play And now as I wander Hello there, all you expat wannabes. I'm Johnny Mueller, and you're listening to The Expat Files, Living in Latin America, the show that tells you just what it's like to live, work, play, and or retire down here in Latin America. It's a mix of the good, the bad, the ugly, and the great, and it's all right here, so let's get started. You know how I always talk about the fact that in most Latin countries, the vast majority of them, I should say, big brother just doesn't exist, or what you might call little brothers just crawling along on all fours. Sure, all the fat-ass Latin corrupt bureaucrats are trying to pass first-world laws, and they do it, including all the Big Brother ones. But luckily for us, they never enact laws, creating the police or strong-armed forces like, for example, child services enforcement agencies or IRS SWAT teams to batter your door down and haul you away. So they have tons of laws on the books, but almost no enforcement, and when there is, it's very spotty. What's not to like about that? The only time you're ever going to get caught in and chewed up by the lard asses in the bureaucratic machine down here is if you have a business that depends on multiple government permissions that repeatedly need to be renewed. Like, for example, owning a taxi business. Captain Mango could tell you a thing or three about that. That said, today we have a nice case in point as to just how lax the rules and regs are in good old Latin America. So, I'll start by reading a little excerpt of an email that just came in. It says, Hi, Johnny. I happen to be in Panama City around Christmas time, and I decided on your recommendation to get a cheap, kind of smartphone and a SIM card. Well, I was at the Tucumán airport, and I went up to one of the little kiosks, uh, Claro kiosks, that's the name brand. I checked out all the phones, ended up paying about 65 bucks for one of them, got a new SIM card, paid cash, And I did the whole deal without ever being asked for a single ID document. What I did was hand the young lady behind the desk a little post-it note with my name, address, passport number, and the name of the hotel I was staying at. She never did ask me for a legit ID, no driver's license, passport, or ID card, nothing. And 10 or 15 minutes later, I had that phone in my hand, everything working just fine. In fact, she even hooked me up with What's up? Waze, Google Maps, and some other junk I'll never use or need. Oh, and this is the best part. That little post-it pad with all my dats on it? They were all false. Every last one of them. I made them up. I guess you could say it was kind of a test because at that moment I was thinking, man, if she asked me for an ID or anything, I'm just leaving. And even then I had a good comeback line that I think I learned from you on your show. I was just going to tell her I didn't have my passport on me because on the American State Department website, it says on the very first page, and I know it's true because I looked it up, that you, as an American tourist or traveler, should never carry your original passport or ID documents on you. It's unsafe to do that. You should leave them back at your hotel or with your local Latin lawyer in a safe somewhere, whatever. Well, guess what? I never had to use that backup plan. Now, Johnny, as you might imagine... All kinds of scary scenarios flew through my head as I walked up to that kiosk. I was totally expecting the third degree or some kind of gigantic form to fill out, but I got none of it. And I'm talking about Panama, which has a huge first world influence and lots of gringos and tons of Asians. And when you land, they take your fingerprints multiple times and do an iris scan too. What's that all about? And I might add, it ain't cheap. The hotel certainly ain't cheap. But Johnny, just to let you know, You're dead right again. According to all the rules and regs about buying phones in Panama, you're supposed to give up your ID and your personal desk to get a SIM card. Though I'm sure they crack the whip just a little bit harder for Panama citizens. So I'm just reporting that in December, around Christmas time, I was eyewitness to the fact that the gringo advantage rides again. Oh, and you know what really floored me? As I was walking through the airport, I ran into a group of vending machines that were selling SIM cards. Like a Coke or an ATM machine. You stick your credit card in, pick which cell phone company you want a SIM card or data card from. I think there are three or four companies in Panama. And there you have it. For five bucks or so, a brand new SIM card to stick in your own phone with a local phone number. Did you ever hear of that before? All right, meet Johnny again. That comes from Derek G. And my response to that? Yep, Derek, I've seen those SIM card vending machines too. I never got a SIM card from them, but you're right. However, you have to use a credit card, so they got all your debts once you make the purchase. 
So you're back on the radar again, unless you can persuade someone else to lend you their credit card. <laughs> and Derek, about the fact that you can buy a SIM card and a phone without giving your real ID up, I hate to say I told you so. <laughs> Hey, and that's not the only phone and IT-related email I've gotten the last couple of days. Listen to this one. Oh, and this comes from Paul, a previous Expat Insider seminar attendee. He says, Johnny, I went to Guatemala recently, and I went and bought a prepaid smartphone and SIM card. I paid cash and gave an obviously fake name without having to provide any numbers or even show a Photoshopped copy of a passport. Ha ha! All right, there we have another example of how you can stay off the radar. Just think about it. Try getting a cell phone or any kind of IT service up in the States without flashing a real bona fide government-issued ID and giving up a boatload of other personal debts they'll probably be checking on. Talk about the benefits of lag time, huh? Of course, when you sign up for utilities or buy a smartphone, whatever, here in Latin America, you could give up all your debts. Most people do. The point is, most of you listeners I know are absolutely sick of having all your personal debts cataloged, filed, stored, and shared by all the alphabet agencies. Not to mention all your debts gathered by Google and others to be sold off to the highest bidder. Yep, they look at us consumers like ripe fool idiots for multiple marketing purposes. Remember, like I said in many past shows, when you come to Latin America, you got a second chance at more or less wiping the slate clean. That means getting some or a lot of your privacy back. But to what degree you achieve that all depends on you. Oh, and on that note, got an email from a guy the other day. He said, Johnny, look, I'm getting my Social Security checks direct deposited to my bank where I live in the States. In the next six months or so, I'll be moving down either to Guatemala, Colombia, or Ecuador. I haven't decided yet. The dilemma is when I get there and open a bank account and set up my direct deposits down there. There's a form you fill out, or if you're lucky enough to get through their 800 number, you can give the information out over the phone. But I'm looking at the form right now. It's on the Social Security website, and they're asking me for my home address in my new country. They say they needed to send snail mail publications to me every couple of months. And believe me, I know why they do that. You think they're there to help you. Well, they're not. It's kind of a catch-22. My brother's on Social Security, and they send him those mailings. They ask you a few questions, like, for example, is your marital status the same? Has your number of dependents changed? Has a kid moved out of the house? Questions like that to keep tabs on you. But the real reason they send out those inquiries, and I know this for a fact, is to see if you're still alive. Because if you don't send a response to them in 30 days or so, they'll cut off your direct deposits. I know that's true because it happened to my brother. Whether it was a misplaced piece of snail mail, I don't know. But once last year, they cut off two months' worth of Social Security deposits simply because he didn't return that form within 30 days saying that, nope, nothing's changed. Same as always. Just that little glitch and he got screwed out of two months of Social Security. So, Johnny, my question is, when you move down to a Latin American country and you're having checks direct deposited from the U.S. government to your new bank account, the only way that's going to happen is if you give them your real address in your new Latin country. But... Aren't you jumping right back on the radar again? Problem is, you give your real address to any government agency and they all have it. Oh, and that email comes from Finney. Mr. Finney, sounds Irish. All right, Finney, here's the solution. Just make a deal with your lawyer to receive your mail at his office. In other words, make your Latin lawyer's office your snail mail address. And don't worry, you're not breaking any laws or lying there because the United States government knows that many third world countries, although they do have snail mail, it's not at all dependable. But a lawyer's address in a business office in a business district of a Latin city will always get snail mail with regularity. So by all means, make a deal with your lawyer to use his address as yours. That's an excellent way to maintain a good level of privacy once you move down to Latin America. And believe it or not, most lawyers won't even charge you for it. And they won't open your mail either. Of course, that also means if you're a backpacker slash skin flint type of guy and you prefer to come down to Latin America and do everything yourself, you probably won't have a regular lawyer that you're on a first name basis with who will provide that kind of service for you. All right, switching gears a bit. Remember a couple of shows ago I was talking about oddball names you run into here in Latin America? Yeah, right, like you don't up in the States. Anyway, last time I was interviewing for maintenance men and gardeners, 
three guys with kind of oddball names showed up. One guy, his name was Rusty. <laughs> I know up in the States, that'd be a nickname. You wouldn't be Rusty on your documents. It's a nickname because you're a toe-headed guy or have red hair. Or with a real ruddy kind of Irish complexion. Right, Finny? By the way, that toe-headed thing. I don't get that. <laughs> Do you? Anyway, Rusty came in for an interview and it said Rusty on his cedula. Another guy showed up, name was Otto, O-T-T-O. Nothing really unusual about that, a lot of autos down here. But when I looked at his cedula, his name was really Othello, you know, like the black Shakespearean king. So that day I learned something. Otto is actually short for Othello. Figure it out. First couple letters of Othello and the last one. Otto. Except this guy didn't know Othello was a black king and he didn't know Shakespeare from Jake the Snake. Now you'd think a person would know at least a little about the origin of his own name, but he didn't. Oh, then another guy showed up. His name was Ponti, P-O-N-T-I, which as it turned out was short for Pontiac. Yep, his mama named him Pontiac Jack Martinez. After the car, not the warrior Indian chief. <laughs> Now, Ponty didn't even know they named the car after the Indian chief, which is kind of interesting. I mean, it's one way to live on in history, huh? But it's still kind of odd. He thinks he's named after a car. Oh, and speaking of Otto, a lot of German-born guys named Otto. Otto Preminger, Otto von Bismarck. But American-born kids? Man, I only knew one. We used to call him Otto Pilot. And sometimes when he was drinking, Otto Control. <laughs> but as they say, what's in a name? I mean, really, look at my name. Older folks think I was named after the song Johnny Be Good, while younger people think I was named after Johnny Rotten. <laughs> I say, let them wonder. All right, now for all you sort of musical kind of guys and gals. I'm a bit musical myself. In fact, I've got at least six guitars, some really good ones too. So if I wasn't at least a little bit musical, I'd be kind of an idiot for having all that stuff, wouldn't I? Anyway, this email is entitled, Recommendations for a Musician in Latin America. It starts, Hi Johnny, I've been listening to your broadcasts for almost a year now and I would like to thank you for all the work you put into it. You're a very eloquent and comical speaker and it made me sharpen my game from my own YouTube videos. I don't know how you can talk an entire half hour without saying um or hmm or uh. It has made me step up my public speaking game, so thanks for that. All right, me Johnny here. I'd like to comment on that. But first, I like to throw in a few ums and ums and clear my throat a bit. <laughs> well, you know, Joseph, and this comes from Joseph, by the way, the reason why there are no ums or ahs or throat-clearing guttural vocalizations in my shows is because I've got a dirty little secret. And I'll tell you right now, when I sit down to do the show, I pick a couple of themes, emails, news articles, and just some general thoughts. And start babbling. When I get to around the 25-minute mark, I shut it down, get something to eat or exercise for an hour or so, sit down again, I go back to what I've recorded, start from the very beginning, listen closely, and edit out all the ums and dems and some of the things that would make me sound like a common doofus from the streets of Chicago, and force the show as it gets to the very end to hit exactly 28 minutes. Because 28 minutes is exactly what the producer up at the big station in New York wants it to come in on. So I'm actually doing two run-throughs of the show. The first one, a kind of dress rehearsal. Oh, and by the way, a lot of times people will say, Johnny, how much of that stuff do you write down ahead of time? They say, how much is scripted? I say, none. I've got some little note cards with ideas I've jotted down, but no whole sentences or paragraphs. Just in case you were wondering. That said, let's get back to Joseph's musically themed email. He says, in some of your podcasts, you refer to yourself as a B-grade musician. So I figure you'd be the right person to ask about musically vibrant places to spend a couple of months in, specifically Guatemala. I play jazz guitar, he says, and I like singing folk tunes too. I also play fiddle in the Quebecois, Cape Breton, and Irish style. Hmm, I detect a little hey there, great white North Canadian in this guy. Anyway, he says, I play gigs every now and then. In short, I'm into any traditional and rootsy acoustic music. You could say that playing music is the drug of my choice, and I love going to places down south and jamming with the locals. In fact, he says, last winter, I went to Sayaluta, Mexico, and man, did it have a lot to offer. 
Nice small colonial seaside town with great food, hot babes, and music everywhere. You had mariachi bands, brass bands, complete with sousaphone and everything in between. I played with some locals in the restaurants, and man, did I have a good time. There was only one major downside. There was a river of poop flowing right through town past the market, right onto the beach and right into the ocean. This was on the busiest part of the beach, too. Yuck. But I assume this is a common occurrence in many places in Latin America. There seems to always be a stream of raw sewage flowing through the most beautiful areas. By the way, Johnny, I heard towns around Lake Atitlan have the same problem. Oh, but my two trips to Cuba were top-notch for music, and you couldn't ask for anything more. The only downside there is that there's barely any internet to speak of. No connection you could ever run a business from anyway. And many two-tiered rules for locals and visitors. In other words, strict gringo versus local prices. Anyway, I'm getting ready to spend a few months down south and wanted to know if there were any places in Guatemala that have hoppin' roots music scenes. I've created a business that I run online, so I need to have access to good internet connections. But I know that's possible anywhere now, as long as you have one of those cell tower router motives I heard you talk so fondly about. I normally travel to places with a completely open mind, but after two trips to Costa Rica that were downright dull, musically speaking, I now like to investigate before making a trip. Don't get me wrong, Costa Rica is a beautiful place, but I found the music and cultural scene almost non-existent. Any musical happening that I experienced was always done by gringos or Latinos from other countries. Great place to visit, but greatly lacking in the music and cultural department. Anyway, Johnny, if you have any quaint places to recommend in Guatemala that have happening music scenes, let me know. All the best. Joseph, Quebec, Canada. Hey there, Joseph. Let's go through these points one at a time. As far as garbage and poop flowing here in Latin America, man, every single body of water, river, lake, stream is contaminated with fecal bacteria. But you know that already and why you always have to carry your own purifier around with you. By the way, you all know which one I recommend. And if you don't, send me an email, thexpatfiles at gmail.com, and I'll send you my own purified water setup, the one I've got for a house under the counter, and my traveling kit. Remember, I'm an electrical and a biomedical engineer, so I know a little bit about that stuff. Probably a lot more than you do. Plus, back in Chicago, my brother installed the reverse osmosis purifiers, so I've been into pure water at least 30 years. Hey, I know there are lots of great water purification systems out there, under-the-counter and portable, but I seem to have found the cheapest, most reliable, most effective, and most durable and longest-lasting filters, too. And, you know, the portable one I recommend costs around 30 bucks, and it'll last you, how about a lifetime? Oh, and Joseph, don't you find it rather funny, even terribly ironic? Most all Latin countries are dying to be the next Costa Rica. That is, have huge influxes of gringo and European tourists bringing in the dough. And why would tourists come? Well, for the climate, the beauty, the pristine environment, and the culture, right? Meanwhile, the locals sabotage all that by throwing their garbage everywhere and letting the poop flow with reckless abandon. Paints a pretty picture, huh? It just doesn't make sense. Latinos claim to love their country, yet they foul and despoil it, poop in their own sandbox, so to speak, with regularity. You know, it's funny. Every time you see trash receptacles, gringo style, you know, where you have the plastics, the paper, and the general glass and disposable stuff all separated out. It's the do-gooders and the gringos who put it there. And every time you see or read about a cleanup effort, it's the gringos and the do-gooders who've organized it. And you know, gringos and do-gooders, when they get together, they talk about who's really responsible for educating the public. They say the government. They just need more money, more first world grants. And I say, bull poop. That's all wrong and why the vast majority of do-gooders are morons. It's beyond stupid to give Latin American governments money. They're just chock full of lazy, corrupt, bureaucratic slugs. The real problem begins with the mothers and the grandmothers, Latinas with kids. They're the ones that permit their male offspring to use the world as their toilet. They're the ones that are supposed to instill values in their kids as they grow up. And since I'm on a rant here... 
It always drives me nuts when I see a big commercial project under construction and you find out when they submit their architectural plans to the local municipality, they're forced to have the latest and greatest sewage management and gray water treatment and drainage systems. That's a good thing, a very good thing. Meanwhile, the thousands and thousands of little businesses, homes and residences in the surrounding neighborhoods have no sewage treatment facilities at all. Talk about cognitive disconnect. Ah, then, but that's why they call it the third world. Meanwhile, back at Lake Atitlan, considered the most beautiful lake in the world, that's in Guatemala, of course. Joseph says in his email he's heard they have the same sewage problems, too. Yep, like I said, it's endemic throughout Latin America. But if you were to take a little boating trip along the fringes of the lake, you'll see some little floating, somewhat high-tech platforms that look like they're pumping away. Well, guess what? The gringos, the do-gooders, and the Germans have come in with various high-tech cleanup devices. As mentioned, the locals don't give a shit. It takes the gringos, the do-gooders, and in this case, the Germans, and I think the Israelis too. They know the problem and how beautiful the lake is, and they're actually doing something about it. And it's got nothing to do with government. It's all donated. Meanwhile, all the little indigenous towns around the lake just keep on pooping on. So, Joe, Lake Atitlan is on the mend, kind of, but I would never drink the water. Though if you take a ride around the lake, you'll see the locals filling up jugs because the indigenous population can't afford bottled water, which isn't really pure anyway, right? So they'll just gather river and lake water, boil it, and use it for drinking water. However, don't try this at home unless you run it through your own purifier. Then you'll have no problem at all. All right. Where were we? Oh, yeah. Joe talks about his visit to Costa Rica, saying they've got no culture and no musical class at all. Nice place to visit, he says, but he wouldn't want to live there. Well, as for me, I did live there, and I wouldn't even want to visit. <laughs> nope, Costa Rica's 100% off my visit and wish list. The only time I'll intentionally go there is if I end up getting laid over at San Jose Airport, where a bottle of water is only around five bucks and a cup of coffee, eight. Such a deal, huh? But back to Joe, who's wondering about the folk music scene in Guatemala. Well, let me tell you, Joe, you're in for a surprise. Just go to your favorite search engine. Hope it's not Google. I hate Google. Use startpage.com or DuckDuckGo and put in the name Ramon Iglesias. Ramon Iglesias. I-G-L-A-S-I-A-S. He's an old guy in his 70s, a world-famous luthier. That means he makes handmade stringed instruments made out of wood. It's some of the nicest-sounding, most beautiful-looking stuff you've ever seen. There are a couple of YouTubes you'll see on him. A walk through his very cool little studio factory in Guatemala City. Now, this guy makes his instruments from some of the finest hardwoods in the world. He makes violins, cellos, guitars, mandolins, all kinds of instruments, some you've never even heard of. This guy's really old school. He doesn't have a sales pitch or a sales page. All the marketing you'll see is not of his doing. He's got a couple of really young musicians slash technicians that rig up the electronics, the pickups and such, when he builds electric guitars. He's the expert wood custom craftsmanship guy, and the other two 20-something guys do the modern high-tech stuff when necessary. Of course, a lot of his instruments have no electronics at all. They're pure custom works of art. Now, since he uses most exclusively exotic hardwoods, he can't really export his stuff to first world countries because there's all kinds of restrictions on that kind of wood. But he takes one-off orders. In other words, you walk in there, tell him what you want, and he'll build you one. And thus, the word is out with professional musicians all over the world. They'll fly in, he'll build them an instrument, a couple months later, they'll come back, pick it up, and fly back home with it, bringing their guitar or whatever as a personal carry-on. That's how his instruments have ended up all over the world. And how they've ended up in the hands of people you know by name. Yet it's all totally under the radar because he can't get certain export permits. So why am I bringing this guy up? Because you see, the rickety old house this guy lives in, man, that thing must be 150 years old and hasn't had a lick of paint since then. Well, it's a sort of Floyd's Barbershop, a musician's hangout. In other words, if you were to spend a couple hours just mulling around... You'd see all kinds of people with different musical styles and tastes coming in and out of the dump. And it is a dump, but a cool dump. From Latin rock and rollers, rockeros, to Latin metal and jazz guys. 
strictly classical players and orchestra musicians, and indigenous musicians who play handmade marimbas and people who play in folk bands. So, Joe, if you came down to Guatemala, yes, stop in that place. Hope you speak Spanish, by the way, because there might not be anyone there who speaks English. And believe me, Joe, it's really old school. Nothing like a music store you've ever been in. It's like going into some woodworking shop in an overstuffed garage where no one's done a stitch of housekeeping for years. OSHA's biggest nightmare. And yes, Joe, it's a place you'll find everything you need to know about the local indigenous folk scene and everything else in between. Oh, and get this, the place is so casual. As you walk through the front space, the first room, and see all the guitars in various stages of construction and assembly, you might just notice a big glass mason jar, filled to the brim, at least it was last time I was there, with very potent, or so I'm told, pot buds. Samples for satisfied customers. It's kind of like, you know, if you walk into a real estate office or a bank, they'll give you the courtesy pen, cup of coffee, or after-dinner mints. Well, that's kind of Ramon's way of saying, glad you came by, take a sample, come back soon. <laughs> but that's not all. Guatemala's full of tiny little shops that make custom-made marimbas. That's the national instrument. Basically a funky kind of xylophone. In fact, Guatemala, including Honduras and Salvador, have tons of marimba bands. In fact, you'll see marimba bands everywhere at all kinds of events. Though I'm not much for marimba bands or mariachi bands either. You just can't avoid them when you're trekking through Central America. So, Joe, don't forget to ask about that scene. Oh, and Joe, speaking about music and musical instruments, you ought to check out olx.com.gt. Plug in the words musical instruments or instrumentos musicales because olx.com is in Spanish, and you'll see all kinds of musical instruments for sale, including marimbas, guitars, and custom-made folk instruments. Oh, and I go on that site a lot of times looking for vintage guitars. They pop up down here sometimes, and you'll see they're worth a ton of money, but the locals have no idea because there's no vintage market here. Anyway, the other day I ran into a guy selling an old Epiphone acoustic guitar from the 60s, and I immediately went on the net to look up what it was really worth. I checked it out on eBay, and instantly came a non-porn-related pop-up window. It was a Proposition 65 warning from the state of California saying some guitars and musical instruments are made with, get this, cancer-causing materials. Yep, it was the California Office of Environmental Health Hazard Assessment trying to protect me from my guitar. Thank you, California, for being so concerned about me. Yeah, bastards. Man, am I glad I'm in Latin America. You've been listening to the Expat Files Living in Latin America. If you need some help with your own Plan B, you can schedule a one-on-one -on -one phone call with me. But first, download my free Plan B questionnaire at www.thenewexpat.com. Better yet, if you want to get your Plan B going from right up there in the States, just sign up for my 9-hour Expat Essentials course. Get the perfect Plan B blueprint by going to the expatfiles.com slash academy. Nos vemos.